You know, I didn't think I'd give in to my weeb tendencies so soon. I rewatched Death Note over the past two weeks, and that meant I just had to play the Empire of the Rising Sun. For now, it's not quite the glorious empire of my gaijin dreams, but we'll get there. Today is going to be a relatively straightforward Japan guide. I'll be taking you through the Meiji Restoration and Empire building through militarism, colonialism, and economic imperialism. We're looking at a different part of Victoria 3 today than what I normally do. Today we focused almost entirely on a general playstyle, with no particular emphasis on diplomacy, economy, war, or anything. That means this video will be a little bit bigger than usual. I'm going to create a worldwide Japanese empire, and no one can stop me. I have no particular direction which I'll be taking this run to, but I'm basically going to just get good and do what I believe are good plays without much regard for roleplay or a particular playstyle. Japan is one of those nations which has opportunities to do just about anything given its huge population and relatively strong military presence. I'll be exploiting both of those things to demonstrate how powerful a nation can get in Victoria 3 if a player uses all the resources at their disposal. Let's get into it. Japan starts the game off pretty backwards. We've got no laws that I'm particularly happy to see, and our interest groups have lots of backwards ideologies. This is unfortunate and will slow down our reform, but Japan makes up for it later with particular events via the Meiji Restoration. For now, we've got serfdom to abolish, an economic system to implement, schools to open, an army to found, and taxes to collect. This all starts with a strong industry. Now, you're going to see a few strange things that I do here as experiments. The big thing I did was flip between theocracy and monarchy a few times. I was doing this in the hopes of essentially re-rolling my shogun to get one that wasn't with the landowners. I've seen it happen before, but I have no idea how to make it happen predictably. I've seen a rural folk shogun at least once in my test runs, but I haven't done enough research to guarantee making it happen. Either way, swapping between government types to replace your leader can be wise if your shogun is rather bad, or if you just like a bit of chaos. You don't have to do this, since getting the Meiji Restoration is entirely possible even with a bad shogun. This means we've got two priorities for the early game, reforming the government and building up the early industries of Japan. We've got two things on our side as Japan, a huge population and lots of natural resources. We're going to basically tax the crap out of our people to fund a relatively large construction industry. With that construction, we'll begin shaping the ethos of our nation. Remember that any given pop will have an interest group based on their job. If we want to industrialize and reform society, we'll want lots of power for the industrialists and the intelligentsia. We can do that by generating lots of capitalists and academics, which we do with any manufacturing industry and with universities. We need universities anyway to help us with technology, so that's perfect. Getting laws passed as Japan is a dice roll, unfortunately. It's relatively easy to insert the intelligentsia or rural folk into the government alongside the shogunate and Buddhist monks, but that means you'll have an extremely low chance to pass most laws. If you just can't get anything passed, you may want to reset your run and hope for better luck while the run is early on. Your priority for laws to pass are abolishing serfdom, getting agrarianism, per capita taxation, religious schools, and eventually professional army. It's your choice whether to get rid of isolationism or not, but I personally prefer the additional authority until later on when I get more voting rights. While you're an autocratic monarchy, the extra 50% authority is huge, however it falls off later. That being said, trade is really good for generating buy and sell orders for goods in your supply chain and for getting juicy tariffs. So it's up to you which one you want to pick. I chose isolationism at first because in my opinion the consumption taxes you can generate with authority outweigh the bonuses that trade can offer, but don't take that as a truth, just an opinion. Beyond the nation's internal politics, we also need to think about what to build. The first piece of our nation's supply chain we'll want to establish is tool workshops. We can use those tools for mining and for getting lumber camps up to the next production method. Since we'll be needing iron and coal later, we can preemptively build them up even if right now we won't use them. In terms of immediate needs, we'll be using this iron and coal for steel, which we'll use for better tools, and for motors. Those motors will of course be for railways. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here though, so let's back up. Motors won't come for a while since getting railway tech will take some time. In the meantime, we can build up some of our consumer goods. We have access to dyes and cotton, so we can make lots of clothes. In general, I really like clothes as both a generator of high quality jobs, and as a way to increase the GDP. Clothes are in basically endless demand simply because pops will always consume them, and as they get cheaper, they consume more. When more are consumed, demand continues to increase, which puts the price back up after it drops from a high supply. Since dyes and cotton are plentiful here in Japan, we can gain lots of income taxes and start on a living through this method. As you build up industries in a particular state, try to build up government bureaucracy in that same area so that the tax capacity there can keep up. 
It's no good to build up highly lucrative buildings in a place where the taxes just go to waste. As you build those government bureaucracies, you should also build paper mills to keep government goods cheap. The last things to build are universities. We need innovations and qualifications across the nation, and we also want to bolster the intelligentsia to help reform the country. Beyond that, building all this stuff will increase your government budget. You're likely best off building up construction sectors as you increase your budget, but you can also consider lowering taxes to generate more loyalists from the standard of living increases. With more loyalists, passing laws will become easier, but it's unnecessary. Consider it a safety. If you want to live life on the edge, keep taxes maximized and continue expanding the economy. If you want to keep it slow and steady, steadily lower your taxes and make your internal reforms with more ease. This might sound like a lot to do, but at the end of the day, it's simpler than it looks. You just have to build up the basic industries that any nation would need to industrialize, while using the shifting demographics that these industries create to slowly change your politics to better suit your goals. Since the process of demographic shifting is slow though, we'll instead take the gamble that maybe those 10% chances will work. I essentially just did this for the first 20 years or so of the game. I focused entirely on the internal, with no concern for the outside world. After some time though, I passed colonial exploitation, and from there I started to consider my outward plans. The economic base I had built up gave me much better interest groups. Although the shogunate was still powerful and in my government, the industrialists were quickly gaining. They were up to 20% clout by 1860, and with the industrialists still climbing, I was able to get interventionism. I'm just about ready to start up an arms industry that I could use against my neighbors, but I'm taking my time, since I have nothing really threatening me. At the end of the day, as Japan, no one will realistically come after you, since most great powers are too passive to attack you, especially if you've grown your economy how I have in the first 20 years. Eventually, the shogunate stopped being powerful, so I took them out of government and replaced them with the industrialists. Although my legitimacy is low, I have all the laws that I want now, so I'm okay with it. This was so that I could start progressing the honorable restoration. It will take some time, but any progress you make stays, even if it's not consecutive, so all time we spend without the shogunate in government is movement towards a better government. We'll talk about why the honorable restoration is good later on once it actually happens, but rest assured, if you can make it happen, it's amazing. In order to further ensure that we can keep the shogunate out of power, I instituted landed voting, knowing that most of my electoral base is composed of capitalists who will vote for the industrialists, I assumed I'd get a huge industrialist voter base, but something interesting happened in my case. When the elections began, no parties were forming, which was odd. Normally, interest groups will band into parties relatively quickly. In my case, only one interest group formed a party, the Intelligentsia. This meant that once elections hit, the only interest group with any amount of clout was the Intelligentsia. I'm not complaining, I just think it was funny. Look at that, 95% clout. Not bad at all. The best part was that the industrialists wanted to join the Intelligentsia's party. This meant I now had a party split between the two best interest groups, which together held all the clout in the entire country. I plan to do some experiments later on to see about making this happen more consistently one day, but for now, I don't know how this happened. I can only assume it was just dumb luck and no parties were created during the election. Once the industrialists joined the party, they had 60% clout, cementing their control and ensuring the shogunate was no more. Now I only needed to wait for the honorable restoration. Here I am in 1865 with all-powerful industrialist intelligentsia as Japan. Not bad at all. It was time to build up the arms, munitions, and naval industries so that we could look outwards truly. Luckily, Japan has lots of lead and sulfur for usage with chemical plants and munitions plants. Like I said before, Japan has lots of raw materials. Assuming you switched to professional army before, you'll have one of the most modernized armies in the game, with skirmish infantry and mobile artillery. You should reach for shrapnel artillery next, but that could take a bit of time, so don't rest on your laurels waiting for it. Instead, it's time to get a little bit of an empire going. The first war we'll do this run will be a big one. We're taking Alaska and getting Western recognition along with it. In my game, Russia had a defensive pact with Prussia and Austria, making this war feel quite risky, but in reality, it'll be extremely simple. Our war goals are conquest of Alaska, recognition, and war operations from Russia. When the war starts, we immediately invade Alaska with a small force, knowing that no one will be there to stop it, nor will Russia send anyone to save Alaska later. We keep most of our army garrisoned to Japan so that if any naval invasions arrive on the mainland, they get taken care of. Now you just wait until you win. We essentially get Alaska for free, alongside Russian money and great power status, all in one fell swoop. I'd say more about the war, but I mean, what's there to say? The AI, for whatever reason, simply won't send trips to Alaska, despite that being the war goal. This makes it a free war. That means this section is already over, and we'll move back to peacetime.
With all this progress made, I chose to take some time while waiting for the Meiji Restoration to just build up the economy. This means getting new production technology and mostly constructing a consumer economy. Besides the extra naval bases, all of my goods will be consumed locally. I still have isolationism so there are no foreign markets to sell to. In order to fulfill our pop's demands, we're going to build lots and lots of tobacco, tea, clothes, furniture, and all the industries to support them. I'll also add in more and more bureaucracy, both for tax capacity and to support the new institutions I've been implementing over time. GDP growth is all about simply making more stuff, no matter what that stuff is. Since we can't generate excess demand for goods through trade, we're going to focus on getting standard of living for our pops higher. Remember that as pops gain standard of living, they will consume more goods across the board. We can increase standard of living by creating higher quality jobs through advanced production methods. And we can make popularly consumed goods cheaper. This is why I'm going to make a ton of rice farms. Since grain is often consumed at lower standards of living, having lots of it around will elevate tons of people out of poverty. With their higher standards, they'll also increase the minimum wages of the states they live in. When wages are higher, businesses profit less, but people make more money and buy more stuff. This creates a cycle of businesses losing profits to higher wages, but selling more goods because people can afford more stuff. As well, I'll be lowering taxes from this point on in the hopes that they will also increase consumption. As well, I'll be lowering taxes from this point on in the hopes that this will also increase consumption, as well as all the other benefits that lower taxes provide. I'd say once you hit around 15 standard of living, it's a solid choice to start creating fine art. Some of the most profitable businesses in the game are art academies because high level pops consume so much of it. As well, with camera and film photography you can start producing services with art academies. All late game economies consume horrid amounts of services, so having lots around will keep pop wealth growing. At one point, I made the empty brained move of putting the shogunate back into power. I think my logic was that I was done changing laws, so I just wanted to get the highest possible legitimacy. But this was dumb because by having the shogunate in power again, this would stop the major restoration from progressing. I did eventually realize this and switch them out again, but it delayed my run quite a bit since I didn't notice until after a big war with Qing. At least the majority of my time with the shogunate in was during war, so it wouldn't have progressed anyway, but still, reckless on my part. Oh yeah, the war with Qing. One thing I've really got to praise Victoria 3 for is that it ends up encouraging you to go down the historical routes of most nations just by its placement of resources. One raw material you lack as Japan is wood. You need wood for just about every industry at some point in the supply chain, and you need it for a big navy. What place happens to have a whole ton of logging camps available? That would be Manchuria. This means it's time for a war with Qing. I have skirmish infantry with mobile artillery, and I'm pretty sure I could take down Qing. Although they would turn out to be a tougher opponent than I expected, particularly because Austria came to their aid. I added war goals for Outer, Northern, and Southern Manchuria, since those were the states with all the logging camps. I figured a direct invasion strain to Beijing would be the best option, but remember that Beijing has high infrastructure, so using your higher quality troops to win out against such a horde is tougher. Instead, I'll have to invade Outer Manchuria and try to bait the Chinese troops to leave their garrisons in Northern China. Since Manchuria and North China are different HQs, I could send part of my troops to Manchuria relatively easily, and then wait until Qing moves their troops to that front. Once they've done that, I can invade Beijing. At least that's the theory. Sometimes the AI doesn't feel the need to send troops out of the garrison because they have allies, like Austria in this case, to hold their fronts for them. I ended up landing in Manchuria only to be confronted by Austrian troops who could hold their own against me. Meanwhile, Beijing was still protected by Chinese troops, which I couldn't break through with a naval invasion penalty holding me back. That being said, I have no idea how the AI works sometimes because I just did the same strategy again, except this time Qing did send their entire army to confront me in outer Manchuria. I'd have done the Beijing invasion, but I was actually able to push into all three states of Manchuria giving me control over all the war goals. Once I had that, I just sat in defense mode knowing that on the defense I couldn't lose to Austria or Qing given the low infrastructure here. It was slow, but it would work, and I saw no reason to take any risks. I lost a battle or two here or there, but they never ended up kicking me out of holding at least a sliver of each state. Had I been the person playing Qing here, I'd be furious because I couldn't tell my troops which states to prioritize, but as the Japan player, I'm laughing at the fact that my men having the smallest piece of southern Manchuria lets me take the whole state. With Manchuria conquered, the wood shortage is over, and I've also got a couple million new pops to put to work. There's even coal here. Manchuria is a great grab for any power, but Japan in particular since it looks aesthetically pleasing, and we're short on wood here. Speaking of shortages, I was hitting that point in any Victoria 3 game where my homeland's natural resources were being exploited to the max, and I would need more. I built up just about every iron mine and coal mine in the country, and I knew I was going to need more. For now, I was fine, but the time was coming where I'd need a whole lot more if I were to keep growing at this rate. This is where colonialism and imperialism come in as necessary mechanics not fall behind. 
well, I say fall behind, but at 300 million GDP, I've already surpassed every AI economically. I'm only really growing more to satisfy the innate desire to see lines on graphs go up that all humans have. I set my eyes on Africa since I knew the scramble for Africa would be starting soon and some of the great powers had already started. I researched quinine and dashed for malaria prevention. It would take some time to get it, but in the meantime I noticed that South Africa was free from Britain. I don't know how it happened, but it did and I took the opportunity to strike. I puppeted in South Africa without a drop of blood and then I went for Zulu and the Boer states. They actually did put up a fight, albeit a hopeless one. I was starting to hit the infamy cap and I was faced with the decision that every imperialistic Victoria 3 nation has to contend with. Is infamy just a number, or do I care? It was my decision at that moment that infamy was just a number. It's unfortunate this is how it is, but infamy often ends up this way for any nation looking to conquer more than a small chunk of land. You'll end up being a pariah for the rest of your life. That means most nations will embargo you, although I am isolationist, and you'll have great powers constantly helping your enemies. Because of how war works in this game though, it's not a big deal. If I consistently have the highest quality troops, and if we never fight in any region with a 3 digit infrastructure number, which is quite rare, then I'll win most, if not all, battles. It was also at this point that the Shogunate finally fell and the Meiji Restoration happened. It would have been slightly earlier if not for my little hiccup, but no harm, no foul, it's here now. When you get the event from the journal, you can either put the Industrialists or the Intelligentsia in power. I chose the Industrialists because I intend to continue growing the economy and to stay a monarchy. If you want to go Communist, you pick the Intelligentsia. For the fall of the samurai event, I usually just take the radicals because soldiers only compose a relatively small number of my pops and they'll return to loyalists eventually. It's better than the innovation gain malice. Now that Meiji Yamato is the emperor, he's an industrialist, which means we can have them in power without tanking our legitimacy. This is why the Meiji restoration is extremely good. Having an industrialist king is akin to having Queen Victoria. I'm not sure of any other existing nations that get an industrialist monarch. I know France has an intelligentsia king, which is also super good, but man, Getting super high legitimacy with industrialists is just so good. Anyway, we get new journal entries as part of the Meiji Restoration, two of which are already complete. I believe one of them had to do with that samurai event from before, but I don't know what the other one is. The final one is to end Sakoku La, which just requires us to open up for trade. At this point, I'm planning to liberalize, so I may as well get protectionism going. The extra tariffs will be nice, but I don't plan to do much trading, so I don't want to micromanage trade routes this run. I already did enough of that in my America campaign. Best part about becoming Meiji Japan is the new red color. Similar to Britain and how we've got Industrialist Monarch, we also get a nice red map color. While you have the Major Restoration Journal entry available, you'll get all sorts of random events, but to be honest, I usually complete the entry so quickly that I don't know what all the events are. There's one where you get to pick between siding with Asia or Europe, called Which Way the Wind Blows. Since I intend to conquer Qing, the obvious choice is to side with the West, which I do. Upon completion of the Meiji Restoration, you get a renewed Japan, which gives you a few options to pick from, but the only good one is the one with claims to Korea. With those claims, what are we waiting for? Korea has tons of iron, lead, coal, and even more lumber for us, so I figured it'll be wise to go after them right away. They've got Qing to protect them, but we beat Qing once, surely we can do it again. This war would turn out to almost be a disaster for my nation. Since I decided the infamy was just a number, it was time to just add a bunch of war goals. I was going to conquer all of Korea in one war. Strangely, I didn't get a claim on one of Korea's states. I don't know if that's intentional, but basically, I use the return state war goal on everything except for the one state of Yang Ho. No matter, what's a little more infamy on top of being over the cap anyway? Qing added a war goal to release Manchuria. This was genuinely a little concerning since they had pretty easy access to those states. Russia decided to join the war as well, which was a little annoying, but shouldn't affect things too much. Even though the numbers don't appear to be in our favor, I was relying on my higher army quality to handle this war. Right at the outset of the war, I invaded Seoul and easily took it, and then occupied most of Korea. This is when I realized one fatal error in my plan. Remember what I said about winning any battle in a state with less than 3 digit infrastructure? Guess who built up tons of railways in Manchuria? Turns out, those hundreds of Qing battalions were able to just human wave over my superior troops thanks to all the infrastructure I built. Now I was in trouble because Qing actually was able to occupy their war goals. In order to get the war exhaustion damage for holding their war goal, they need to hold what would be the capital of Manchuria if they were free. That would be southern Manchuria, which was right on the border with Qing. This meant that even though I held all of Korea, Qing would drain my war support first. I had to go and occupy Beijing and try to take out their support faster than they could get mine. This wouldn't be easy, but the strategy from last time is what I would do. While all the Chinese troops were in Manchuria, I invaded Beijing and just kept pushing around that area, but it was useless. Because Qing had that huge head start on draining my war support, things looked hopeless. I wasn't one to give up though, and I wasn't going to lose this war. I had a trick up my sleeve. No, it was not to just white peace and try again. I was getting Korea this war, no doubt about it. 
I managed to occupy a pretty decent chunk of China, but I had to pull out my ace. Yeah, I just released Manchuria as a subject before China could liberate them. This way they no longer hold the war goal, since the war goal is no longer even part of this war, and I get to keep Manchuria, kind of. See, they get released as a protectorate, but that's fine because I can just puppet them right after this war. We have no truce, and I also deleted all of their barracks before hitting the release button. Quite frankly, I didn't think this would work. I assumed that Manchuria would still be in the war, and their land would still be occupied, but the Liberate War Goal would just change the Liberate Subject War Goal. Little did I know that Paradox did not think this far ahead. With Qing suddenly no longer holding the War Goal, and me occupying most of North China, they capitulated in no time, giving me all of Korea. I didn't even have to get them to minus 100 support, they just surrendered, knowing they couldn't get to the War Goal. The War Goal which no longer exists, by the way. This was probably the slimiest trick I used in this run to ensure I got what I wanted. See, I was about four and a half hours deep into this run, and I wasn't going to reset over a single mistake, and I also wasn't going to white peace and wait for a truce timer to take Korea. Modern problems require modern solutions. Right after the war, my first action was to make our protectorate of Manchuria into a puppet, which they immediately backed down to, and then later on it annexed them. For now, since they're still in my market, all the logging camps there will still be sending their goods off to me for my industries, and since Manchuria is my puppet, they won't do anything stupid during the truce timer. France almost supported Manchuria, but I simply offered France a treaty port, knowing it would make them join my side, and then immediately become neutral. See, when a nation takes a side, you can still sway them to your own side, but when you do that, they recalculate their feelings and will almost always abandon you right away. Once I did that, Manchuria backed down. From here on, my military ambitions knew new bounds. Anyway, from here it's mostly just puppet wars to get whoever looked juicy. I first went after Portugal, who also had the Marina Kingdom in the war. I added a puppet war goal to them too, knowing this would be a relatively simple war of invading various capitals until I won. Austria was in the war, but what were they going to do? Because the AI isn't very good at naval invasions in most cases, you're safe off in Japan while you just invade everyone else's capitals. It was also during this time that I got malaria prevention, so it was also time to colonize all of Central Africa. Most of it was still up for grabs. I also annexed South Africa simply for the map aesthetic. I did notice that America had taken most of the Congolese coast, so I quickly attacked the Congo Kingdom to get access to Central Africa before America could grab it all up. During that war, the Italians actually did manage to land in Tokyo, but it didn't really matter since I was able to white piece the Congo's remaining allies before they could enforce anything on me. I also decided that since I was going to have all these puppets, I may as well extract their pops. I put in multiculturalism and total separation of church and state so they'd start mass immigrating to Japan. Russia tried to cut me down to size one time. I just fought them in Manchuria and won with the ease of course. I also had a couple native uprisings with various great powers supporting them. Those ones were frustrating to deal with, but I did eventually get through them. I also brought Manchuria properly back into the fold after their borrowed autonomy from me. I popped into Australia and did many more native uprising wars. All the while building up the economy more and more using the same loops I had mentioned before. Even though I have protectionism now, I still didn't do much trading, electing to protect the domestic supply of all the trade routes the AI made with me so I could make some tariffs and prevent any big shakeups to local market prices. It wasn't until I attacked Qing again that I had a war with any real stakes come up. There were two things I wanted from Qing. Beijing for the Forbidden Palace and all of its coastline along the Bohai Bay for map aesthetic reasons. See, Japan suffers from what I like to call nameplate dysmorphia. When you rule all of the Japanese archipelago, your nameplate looks like absolute trash as Japan. It's disgusting and a disgrace to the Japanese nation. We need a nice nameplate, and right now, the Manchuria Korea nameplate is okay, but it needs to be better. This is why I'll be taking a bunch of states along the coastline of Qing. Gameplay wise, I'm doing this for the extra population, natural resources, and the Forbidden Palace, but in reality I'm doing it for the look. Because of how the last war went, I was a little apprehensive, but ultimately I had upgraded a trench infantry and shrapnel artillery by this point. So dealing with Qing's line infantry was a joke now, even with all the infrastructure. I was just grateful Qing didn't back down, which was thanks to Russia joining the war. If they had backed down, wouldn't be able to get a nice coastline as easily. Anyway, the war was uneventful for the most part. China's lines collapsed quickly, and I got the land I wanted after some time. Qing always takes a long time to lose war support because of how big they are, so any war against them will take some time. By this point, I was almost at 1 billion GDP, but more importantly, Japan's name spread much more nicely across East Asia. I then continued the puppeting spree, and added Egypt to my collection. There was a little hiccup with France and Italy during this war for Egypt, where they wanted to free Hokkaido and I couldn't get a foothold in France, and they managed to get a landing in Tokyo, and I was simultaneously fighting a native uprising in Africa, but the French and Italian navy sunk all my convoys, and blah 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 blah. In the end I just white pieced eventually, once France's war support got a little lower. More importantly, I completed the open arms journal entry, which let me get a permanent migration attraction modifier. This would let me steal even more pops from my puppets, which I could put to work back home. I next puppeted the United States, which had lost control of New Africa and even lost Texas to Mexico. 
It was a sad USA, but a USA nonetheless. You might be wondering how all these big nations are ending up as major powers and not great powers, by the way. This is because of how great power status is calculated. Basically, you have to have a certain amount of prestige based on the amount of prestige all the great powers have. I'm not sure what the actual formula is, but basically my massive prestige is inflating the number so that many nations which would normally be great powers end up as major powers, and the vast majority of nations are ending up as insignificant powers. The prestige needed for any given prestige rank is based on that calculated number, allowing me to puppet most nations easily since they often back down in fear of me. From here, there isn't too much to say. The game started to get super laggy from all the population migration, but I kept on keeping on to demonstrate how powerful Japan can be. I went off and puppeted the Netherlands, Belgium, Mexico, New Africa, and the British Raj in a relatively short time. I then immediately annexed the British Raj so I could access all the raw materials and let their pops migrate around since they had migration controls on, preventing their pops from coming to Japan. At this point, I've been the world hegemon for a while, but I'm officially declaring it with this annexation of British Raj. At this point, I'm completely unstoppable, but just to stick it to the great powers, I decided to become a council republic. Except that it would have sparked a civil war and actually I'm way too lazy for that, so I stayed a monarchy. I instead decided to attack Germany for Hanover and Elba since they have oil, and I was going to make them release Prussia since that would be super cursed. The war was tough, but I was slowly pushing through. Unfortunately, Germany's capital was in Silesia for some reason, so reaching that was pretty slow. My attempts to destroy Germany were stopped by their own lust to destroy themselves, unfortunately. As I was about to reach Silesia, they had a huge revolution, which meant suddenly their capital was landlocked. Oh well, I just pieced out for Bohemia's release and then went on my merry way. I'll be honest, I was a bit upset, but I remembered that I did a similar thing to save myself from Qing before, so if I can do it to someone, they can do it to me, I guess. I took up my rage on Britain by puppeting them, except they did the exact same thing to me that Germany did. Even worse, Britain backed down to become my puppet, then subsequently backed down to their own revolution, becoming independent from me. Because that revolution started before they became a puppet, I couldn't join their side. An overlord can only join their subject in a war during the opening phase, not the middle or end phase. Not to worry though, I just puppeted the new Britain, and they also backed down. I then puppeted Canada. As one last hurrah against the great powers, I puppeted France, who also simply backed down. From there on, I didn't do any more major wars. I annexed Algeria at one point so I could colonize what was left of the Sahara, and that was all war-wise. I did continue developing the economy, and I almost reached 4 billion GDP, before deciding I was done with all the lag, and I ended the run. I made it to 1912 before giving in, which is almost a complete game. So that's Japan. I took them down a powerful path of war and imperialism, using some shady tactics. Japan is lots of fun to play and has the opportunity to become an insanely powerful nation if you can get their early game right. Their ability to access an industrialist monarchy is a huge boon, and their relative safety as an island nation makes it easy to conduct war safely. Given the right guiding hand, Japan can become the greatest power on earth, and all it takes is a little bit of imperialism. That's Japan's one real weakness. You do have to colonize or imperialize for raw goods. But then again, what nation doesn't? I suppose Qing, which by the way, if you want to see Qing's power, check out my guide to economy building. If you enjoyed the video, consider checking out the other guides. I'll likely do some more nation-focused guides like this one in the future, since I've covered almost all the major gameplay facets of Victoria 3 now using great powers. Thank you for your time.